appreciate that. Uh, thanks for having me. And I really want to thank you for giving me the coveted right before lunch spot. <laughs> I'll try to uh, entertain you a little bit while I sort of pique your interest. If I could find my uh, briefing, where would I look for that? Presentation. There it is. Okay, so that's me. Uh, this is what I'm going to talk to you about a little bit today. Uh, and uh, it's a brief outline. I think uh, I'm going to try to pique your interest in where the Army's going from uh, trying to equip future soldiers and how modeling and analysis can help and enable us to make the right kinds of decisions on where we need to go to equip soldiers in the future. Uh, <clears throat> And I also want to uh, talk a little bit about uh, what I see are some of the challenges for the modeling and sim community. I think uh, you are even doing a little self-policing here because I've heard some of them already come up. And uh, from my perspective where I sit of trying to apply the models for decision making, uh, I see that there can be some great advances that you all can achieve as a group that looks toward standardization, looks toward taking advantage of human data sets that are already in existence and identifying gaps that the community can address collectively rather than having thousands of points of light running around doing experiments and then trying to connect uh, in, in a little less rigorous way. So here's my uh, paid announcement of where I come from. I'm up in Natick, Massachusetts. Uh, about uh, 14 miles west of the center city of Boston, it's a great area. It's a tremendously active and powerful academic environment. Just imagine the universities that are located in that area, uh, the healthcare facilities that we connect to as well in terms of medical uh, research, uh, and there's a lot going on there. That's uh, part of the reason why we're there. Um, but uh, you can see up in the top right hand corner actually one of our guys here in the back, uh, Leif Hasselquist, uh, is there making an adjustment in the biomech lab on one of the soldiers that he's studying uh, a, a combat load on. Uh, but uh, the other areas we work in Natick are airdrop and aerial delivery, clothing and protective equipment for soldiers, uh, basing. Uh, and uh, feeding. We're the ones that do all the feeding for all the services. So when you rip open a meal ready to eat, an MRE, uh, it comes from Natick. Uh, now we don't make them there, uh, industry makes it for us, as does most of the stuff that we do. We do the science and technology to feed into industry uh, to make the stuff. All right, what's the problem I have? Uh, you heard I'm a retired colonel, I'm a soldier at heart. My daughter's a soldier. I take these problems seriously. I wake up in the morning and this is what motivates me. So pardon me if I, if I you know, give the, a very biased opinion to you, but that's uh, in my DNA. That's where I come from. Okay, very famous picture. Comes from one of the soldiers uh, uh, in northern Iraq uh, in uh, operations around, I think, 2004, somewhere around in there. Uh, he's not taking a knee to pray, although he might be coming up with some more four-letter words with regard to that stuff we put on his back. Um, but what he's doing is taking a rest. Uh, he's got somewhere about 120, 130 pounds of lightweight, high-tech equipment on his back. That's an infantry light soldier. He's an airborne soldier. What that means is he's got to take just about everything with him that he's going to need for a 72-hour operation. And that equates to about 130 uh, pounds of gear. Uh, we got to be able to do better than that in terms of getting the stuff lighter, but also learning about and helping them decide what's important to take, how to distribute it. Um, and I think modeling and analysis is a very important tool to allow us to do that. Um, <clears throat> oh, by the way, uh, the system integrator for this system is a soldier, him or herself. When they get ready to go out of the wire to do their mission, they're the ones that are figuring out, hey, what is, should I be taking? And, you know, what should I leave behind? Uh, and they're really just using their experiential base 
uh, to make those kinds of decisions. And I think we can put some science in, in behind that as well, and modeling and analysis can help us do that. Oh, I hit the wrong button there, sorry. There we go. Uh, so let me add to this complexity here a little bit, uh, not just the, the stuff that's hung on the individual soldier, but they've got to do missions. They've got to do them in complex environments, and that's what you see over there. They're not uh, in, in laboratories walking on treadmills. Okay, now that has its place, um, but I'm going to uh, uh, make a pitch to you that you need to, in your uh, data collections and your validations, which are important, make sure you have ecological validity in how you approach these things, and you get the right sets of metrics, uh, output metrics. Uh, we're introducing technology daily to these soldiers. Uh, here you see a soldier hooked into the digital network looking at some sort of a map display. Uh, now they're getting information down to levels that they never had it before. And they've got to deal with it. So we've got to be able to model cognitively uh, how they can get that information, how best to present it, when not to present it. Hey, when I'm getting ready to kick in a door, I don't want something beeping in my ear telling me I got email. Okay? <laughs> Uh, and don't forget that they interact with populations. Uh, this is something that has changed dramatically as the U.S. Army is into uh, uh, a coin environment. That's uh, operations uh, short of counterinsurgency types of operations where the soldiers have got to interact with the population. They've got to be able to go to meetings and, and show a friendly face that they're there to protect uh, in terms of their mission, uh, but then they've got to be able to transition quickly into what we call a kinetic fight. So they might have to, uh, you know, if, a, if an IED or a bomb goes off or they get attacked, they've got to quickly transition. Uh, so we've got to be able to do social and cultural modeling so that we can help them conduct those missions and those counterinsurgency. Environments hot environment. You heard about thermal prediction. Well, they also, right now, hot is where we tend to be operating, but uh, we've got to prepare to uh, be able to deploy to cold environments as well. And don't forget, soldiers never, ever operate individually. If they do, there's something big time wrong. They're always operating in teams. And so now we've got to look at this, take one level of analysis up, not just the individual, uh, but how does they uh, share tasks across the team? And how do they optimize for that team's ultimate uh, success? So that's the problem set that I got to deal with. Uh, what I've probably done is just outline three lifetimes worth of work for all of you uh, in terms of the modeling and analysis that could go to help you, you know, understand and make good decisions about what I've got to do for those soldiers in small units. Uh, Today is a, a, a very opportune time for us in science and technology in the Army, uh, but yet it's one of big challenge. Uh, why is it opportunity for us? Well, uh, the current Assistant Secretary of the Army is a former infantryman, and he has said that he wants to make the soldier, the U U.S. soldier, uh, the decisive weapon system on a battlefield, and he likens it to uh, sort of an, an F-35, okay, that's a new joint strike fighter coming out. When that thing's flying around, it's going to engage the bad guys before they even, ever even know they're in a fight, and they're taken out. When you look at the Medal of Honor citation for Sergeant Sal Juinta, who just got the Medal of Honor about four months ago, they were, that squad that he was uh, employed in used tactics that came from World War II. They basically out on patrol, looking around, kind of bumbling around, you know, looking for the bad guy. And what happened? They didn't know they were there and they got ambushed. Okay? Dr. O'Neill says, I don't want any of my soldiers ever getting ambushed again. And if they are, I want that fight to happen so quick and so fast that the bad guys are neutralized and we don't have Sal Juintas having to do Medal of Honor kinds of activities to save his buddies. Uh, so we look at that and we say, okay, what do we got to do for that soldier in that small unit, don't forget down the bottom, 
uh, we want to empower and burden and protect them. That's kind of our buzzwords, but uh, that's essentially how we want to enable that capability. Now, how does that relate to modeling and analysis? Well, I'm going to tell you that unburden and protect are not two separate, distinct entities. They're interrelated. And you heard about model, or you heard about putting body armor from Tim on an individual, and what does that do to their ability to perform? It slows them down. It reduces their capability. So we're giving them more protection. We're protecting them more, but are we unburdening them? No, we're doing exactly the opposite. We're burdening them. So they can't even get out of the way. So how do we start to analyze that situation to find out what's optimal against certain threats for certain missions in different environments, those kinds of things, so we can now get the right package, if you will, of armor given those conditions and, and, and uh, uh, tasks that they have to do. That's why we're uh, asking the modeling community, and particularly been working with the University of Iowa, to help us answer those kinds of trades-based problems. Now, that tells me about equipping the soldier, all right? And I, that body armor was just one example, but you can think of many others. Uh, uh, think about that, uh, that tactical digital display. If that becomes a burden or if that becomes uh, an enabler, I want to know when and how and when to employ it. Okay, so that is going to tell me about the equipment suite. It's also going to give me an idea of what to invest in. Okay, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. That's where modeling and analysis, I think, in our challenge now, I said this is a time of opportunity, but also a challenge. The challenge is for the Department of Defense, we're getting shrinking budgets. The budget is going down. I'm here to tell you, you, listen, you read the newspaper about the political debate, that's already coming down through the pipes to us in terms of our science and technology budgets. That means I got to know what to invest in, and I need modeling and analysis to help me determine what's going to give me the biggest bang for the buck. Okay? So that's another way that you can help me. <clears throat> so this, I just throw this in to stimulate your imagination when Dr. O'Neill talks, and, and this really came from our organization prepping him on what we think technology will afford the soldier to be able to do. This gives you an idea of where we're going. So if you, any of your models uh, have applicability in these domains, uh, then I want to talk to you. I want your help. Um, <clears throat> particularly uh, uh, acute is this issue of protection. Uh, and, uh, you know, you can read the newspapers about IEDs, in, in, improvised explosive devices and things like that, and how we protect, you know, my daughter against those kinds of weapon systems but yet not unburden them so that they can't get out of the way. Uh, and we were just chatting a little uh, a bit before, uh, during the break, and uh, it, you know, one aspect is make lighter materials. So make, you know, super steel or diamond plates or whatever you, you know, can imagine you can get out there that are lightweight. Well, I'm here to tell you that the materials community is working really hard on that, but that's seven, ten years away when the promise of nanomaterials will be realized. In the meantime, I need modeling and analysis to tell me how to more efficiently and effectively use what I have today. So really big application for me now, and I'll, I'll show you we spent a lot of time talking about this and working on it in the Army. I already touched on a number of these things, and I don't want to insult your intelligence, but uh, you know, it's important to realize that I value modeling and analysis tremendously in terms of where I sit in program planning. Again, trying to determine where to invest on high priority, high impact, making sure that I understand the trade space for whether I empower, unburden, or protect, where I'm going to dial that up in terms of what the product actually looks like, and then also uh, I want to uh, uh, <clears throat> guide uh, this uh, trade space, but I want to be able to do it for the commander as well. And I don't think you've all thought about that. All right, so now you, let me give you a scenario. And, and I love that uh, 
one of the brigadier generals who's responsible for getting stuff out to soldiers, buying it and getting it out there, uh, the, the, his name is uh, Pete Fuller. And he used to come up and he'd stand up there and say, what, is, what do your young people do today when we bring them in the army? They pull out, you know, whatever it is, and they're going like this all the time. And what are they doing? They're looking for information. They're connecting into the network and they're, they're digitally connected. And, and you know, I, I, I just think this is a funny little, you know, gesture that tells you, you know, I look at my kids and sure enough, they're, you know, hey, where are we going to eat? And you know, what are we going to do later tonight after the game? Okay. <laughs> if you take some of the bright spots of your models, condense them down such that a mission commander out in the field, when he's planning his load kit, now has some science behind understanding the effects on performance, and he goes to his load simulator, and he dials up, and he understands the trade space, and does a risk assessment of going out of that wire, I think that's a tremendous value added. Uh, to that commander. So we're looking at those kinds of things to take goodness out of the models, condense it down, know that it isn't perfect, but gets them in a space where it helps them do their mission planning. Uh, and when they're wired into the network, they're doing this sort of a thing. So I think that's another uh, uh, aspect that I hadn't heard talked about. I did hear some training uh, and, of course, trade space and and I also look at it for investment priority. Uh, you know, I put this in, but I, I think I'm preaching to the choir here on this with respect to uh, consideration of the human vice, a mechanical platform. And, you know, oftentimes when I'm talking to, uh, you know, other organizations or even senior leaders in the Army who buy stuff, you know, they think about buying platforms. And by platforms, I mean, big vehicles and and you know we need them there's no question about that but at the heart of everything is the soldier and that's that whether they're operating a vehicle they're running out of the back or whatever it is and I heard about using models and making sure that uh, there are the correct anthropometry and sizing so we can get into vehicles I want to draw your attention to the combat vehicle design on the left and you see the squad in the back there is a nine-man squad right they fit in there just nice and uh, you know they got about uh, I think the engineering tolerance there is about two millimeters between elbows um, but but they're in there at least they're clothed you know the first ones I saw they were naked models but what we got to get is you know think of that problem picture I put out there how do you adjust for the gear that they've got to bring and you know uh, task organize that for the mission okay so these are just some considerations and I did hear some of them already talked about a little bit uh, you know getting baselines for measurements I heard about it with injury uh, a, a prediction in short term setting thresholds uh, okay I get that uh, it, this box is too heavy, I can't lift it up. Then I heard questions about longitudinal dose-response kinds of things. Hey, now you're really hitting on a, on a tough problem. Uh, okay, we've got soldiers who are jumping out of airplanes that are riding in vibratory environments and cockpits that are putting helmet-mounted uh, displays on, adding a, a additional compressive force. We just haven't even scratched the surface on longitudinal dose response studies to understand that trade space. So there's a charge for you right there. Get with the medical community, look at you know, surveillance of injury. That may be able to point you in the right direction to get the high payoff for us in terms of uh, understanding that space. And I, the last point I want to make there is we can't forget uh, you know, the physical and psychological consequences for the soldier himself, but also their family units. You know, how that fits exactly in the modeling, I can't say. But my heart is telling me we got to pay attention to this in terms of resilience. So if I step up a level and I've got soldiers rotating in now into theater, 
and they're going at it 24-7, day after day. Then they come back and they rest and refit. They go back again. And how many times are we going to do this? And what's the toll that that takes psychologically? And how, how might one model that on the family organization so we could put interventions in there? That's really important. And I know that is not something that, you know, jack models will get you to. Okay? I also want to expand your thinking a little bit about modeling and analysis uh, and how we employ it uh, across a broad spectrum of activities. And we, we try to get, uh, if you think of the, the small unit and what I'm really after, which is how well are they going to be able to do their mission, be protected, that kind of a thing. The question comes down to, well, what is their mission? And how do, if I tell you as a modeler, you have to have some context to build that, build that task, those decompose those tasks in a mission, turn that, model it, break it down, whether it's a physical model or, or, or something else. And, and so we come up with what are called operational views or vignettes. And these become the foundational underpinning for models, for other activities, concepting, and, and other things that we do uh, with regard to analyzing that trade space. So operational views, simply put, it's a mission that we send this small unit out to do. It might be a cordon and search. So in a generic cordon and search, they go out, they surround the town, they go in, they look at the population, they look to see if the bad guys are there, whatever it is they got to do, X, Y, Z in a cordon and search. Then here's something else. And what we've done is gotten basically about five operational views that cover around 90% of what soldiers have got to do in the field. And it turns out it's not that big a, a, a space that we have to explore. So when we get these five views, we break them down and they become the underpinning for output metrics for us, if you will. We do some future concepting. This is where we bring great idea people in from industry, from academia, from wherever, outside the government. And we say, well, it, it, in this five, these five operational views, you got an idea of how you might help? And they bring it in and we play it through a war game exercise. And we look to see how it plays out. So we bring in a small unit, they get the mission, they play out the mission, we give them a new technology or concept, there's actual bad guys playing against them, and we see how it turns out. We see if it makes a difference or not. Now, you'll find some really interesting things come out of this sort of a, an analysis. Soldiers will do things a lot differently than you thought they would do it. You had in your mind, I'm going to give them this thing, and they're going to use it, and it's going to help, okay? Uh, example, robots. And I'm, I'm dialing back a few years because we've learned a lot since then, but when we first started bringing little robots onto the battlefield, what did we do? We had one tele operator to run a robot. So this guy in the squad was driving the robot. Well, where was his vision? And, the, and, and, you know, and this was going to help them go into caves and do all kinds of things like this. Okay? But where was his attention when he was driving the robot? <laughs> Okay. Was he looking around? Now, don't forget he's in, in pretty dangerous territory. All right? He wasn't. He's had to watch that robot. So he's now out in his normal mission. He's out. He's now driving the robot. Okay? Oh, who's looking over his back? Well, we had to assign somebody to watch guard on him because this guy's like this. So now we took another guy out of the fight to attend to the robot. You see, so we thought going in that this was a great way of employing robots and it turned out when we did some war gaming and got to use it, it really was not what we thought and it caused us to rethink how we have to use robots on a battlefield. Now we come a long way from there. So we're not there today, but I'm using that as an example. Uh, the last thing, uh, and I think this may be hopefully the only acronym I use today, uh, which I had to scrub hard, let me tell you, coming from the Army. Uh, Mission-based test and evaluation is what that is. And that basically says when we finally get the gear, and we've gone through all of this, we've prototyped it up, 
and we're now running it through tests like human factors tests or things like that. Uh, <clears throat> the modeling and analysis said this is a good way to go. We want to have some evaluation output metrics that come from those operational views and relate to the mission and tell us that we're good, bad, or indifferent on that piece of equipment. So that's kind of how that underpinning ties it all together. But think that that could be a value you do to you. And I heard in the last presentation where you had some user juries and things like that. It's really a mix gets us to when we start going to system level model. I want to focus just for a minute on uh, ballistic, ballistic and blast protection a little bit more. Uh, because this shows the complexity of the piece parts that have to go into trying to figure out how to protect somebody against a threat. All right? We go to the medical community and we ask them for data coming out of theater about wounding. It sounds bad, but it's a necessary part of the problem space to explore. We need to know how our people are getting injured and from what. And so they do forensic analysis on every wounded soldier coming out of theater. What happened? What were the circumstances? How were they injured? Where were they injured? What was the threat? Creating a huge database to inform us on how to protect. We digitize this, the, the, you know, the parts of the body, you know, and we use sizing, we use anthropometry in there, because now we've got to start making different shapes of plates and protective gear. So we, we pull that in. We have test fixtures that measure exposures to blast. So now we're collecting data on uh, surrogates to understand what the blast forces are. How far away can you be? Uh, what's not survivable? What can't we even bother protecting against? Don't go there. Okay, once we put armor on, when that armor gets hit, it'll stop the bullet. What happens behind the armor? Okay, there's a deformation that occurs from this high kinetic contact that can cause some injury to the chest. So we've got to look at methodologies and modeling of behind body armor trauma. So you see where I'm going here. And then we put in physiological pieces. So a really complex set of models now that have got to come together for me, the dumb guy that wants to push a button and say, if I make my plate this big, or if I make it this big, where do I have to put it against a certain threat? And if a new material comes along that allows me to make the plate a lot bigger, but it's a lot lighter and more flexible, what do I get from that in terms of that mission performance? Really, really hard problem. Uh, but the Army is investing heavily in this right now. Why? Because I said that nanotechnology, that's like seven, ten years away. We ain't going to get there for a while. So we've got to do better with what we have. There it is. So we're putting a, a, a large effort into this right now. Uh, the next couple of slides just talk very quickly about a couple of models that the Army is using. So you're from the community. Many of you probably know these. This is uh, Dr. Laurel Allender's. Uh, uh, model primarily and her team from the Army Research Lab imprint. It's a uh, work task kind of an analysis uh, model <clears throat> used to do trade space on vehicular uh, workloads, uh, uh, also on maintenance on vehicles. A uh, very powerful trade-off analysis tool. It's used in every vehicle development uh, uh, program for the Army. Uh, might be worthy of looking uh, from the community uh, the automotive industry uh, might be interested in that uh, as well if you're not familiar with it. Uh, this is a model that comes out of Natick, the Infantry Warrior Simulation, I-Wars. Uh, now what we do are we try to bubble up. This is sort of our larger architecture where we look at the modeling of the small unit effectiveness. So now I have these constituent or component models that I'm trying to hook in to the small unit that says if I start making changes in tactics, in size of the unit, in equipment capability, what does it do to that mission set? Remember that five missions that we have and we can run them through simulations. Uh, an example of this, uh, uh, a war story now. 
there's something, uh, you know, here, okay, here's my second use of an acronym, the XM25. Uh, if you Google that, you're going to find that's an experimental grenade launcher. There are five of these made in the world right now. They're in Afghanistan. Uh, this thing is a game changer for the infantry. Uh, basically, what it does is it allows someone to point at a target from anywhere, okay, pass a message over to a, a grenadier with this weapon. He just raises it up, points in a general direction. It says, oh, you're there. Pull the trigger. All right, away goes the grenade, and it allows the infantry to, a euphemism, neutralize the enemy who's hiding behind walls. So they don't have to worry about shooting, they can bring this thing right down on top of their head. Um, the infantry that are using this and testing it now, it's a prototype, uh, they've nicknamed it the Punisher. I expect that this will be uh, put in the inventory of the Army in the future, but this was played in I Wars. And we gave these capabilities a squad and saw the tremendous advantage it gave them of enemy that was hiding behind walls that they couldn't get to. Um, and uh, who, you know, would have to be neutralized. Uh, and this one's my favorite. Uh, this is the work we've been doing with Kareem and, and the University of Iowa. And O&R has uh, stepped into the fray to help us out. Uh, to come up with those biomechanical tools, and you saw Tim give you some of the output of uh, how do we play that trade space when we want to get these new materials and build armors and put them on different parts of the body and uh, see what the output is uh, dynamically uh, of that individual, uh, of those torques and forces and fatigue and those sorts of things. Uh, I think this is a very powerful tool in development and I look forward to uh, its you know, continued work. Now I want to uh, just challenge you a little bit because, and, and I'm going to go right to the guys developing Santos and other dynamic uh, models and suggest that uh, there are, you know, humans decide on how they move. Well, how do they decide on how they move? So if you look at that little graphic at the top of, you know, the guy swinging a hammer. Uh, the, the lines represent different trajectories that that end of that hammer might take, but where do they end up? They all end up in the same end spot, okay? How do you decide which trajectory you're going to take to, to complete that motion? Well, you heard that maybe we set up optimization criteria, such as comfort. Minimal torque, low use of energy, etc., etc. And maybe what we do is we run the models and we make adjustments on those until they look right. And they can validate to some degree against what we might collect. But look, you know, we might find that we get a lot of variability in that trajectory. The point is, is that humans use that variability. Um, that's uh, a, a, an advantage of us as a biological system. And I think when you look at system level output, you need to start thinking a little bit differently about <clears throat> how those trajectories are generated. And I think the, there's a lot to be learned from areas of physics, theoretical physics, thermodynamics, mathematics of dynamical systems that self-organize to get to equifinality, which is that final point there where the hammer hits whatever it is he's striking. And that may be a way to drive some of these models in a more appropriate way. And I just put that out as a, a, a challenge to think about, um, as opposed to trying to a priori come up with ways that we think we optimize on, but we're not quite sure of, and so what we do is make adjustments along the way till it looks right. Okay? Something to think about. I'm not saying that this is the way, but I think that these tools offer us new ways of looking at the problem. All right, so what does it take? Uh, I, I talked about earlier uh, making our 
predictions, our models, and our data to uh, validate those more ecologically valid. It doesn't help me if we're just doing something on a treadmill in a lab taking energy cost. When if you think back to my problem picture, they're running over various terrain, they're doing all kinds of complex tasks in a very rich, varied environment in which they can do things many different ways to solve a problem. Okay, so think about this ecological approach as you do your modeling. Uh, the uh, second bullet pretty much uh, uh, echoes that. I already talked about applying some of the new mathematics or some mathematics that aren't new but were used for different things. Start thinking about applying them uh, to these situations. Uh, and specifically, I'm looking at uh, you know, thermodynamics, uh, attractor uh, theory, chaos theory, to drive those dynamic models. Because once they get going, I think you got it exactly right. You're using the dynamics of the masses and the forces and accelerations to predict those torques. But what's driving that traje trajectory? And it's not kinematics. Don't film them and say, well, that's it. Because that's it for that one situation, the way they did it that one time. And when I want the value of modeling, which is change the environment, the kinem kinematics are no longer relevant. Right? So that, in my view, is a very, very limited approach to uh, taking uh, modeling analysis. Create a library of output metrics that are re relevant to the mission space. And mission can be anything. It can be military mission, it can be driving a truck. Right, but whatever it is, come out with a series of metrics that the community has agreed to that represent this operational vignette for military, that's what it is, but that we get some common ground on output. So we can agree that when I compare over here, I get a, a valid comparison. I don't have an apple or a banana I'm trying to you know, put together in fruit salad. I, I would really ask you to consider that. That, you know, just start slow. Come out with, you know, don't, don't fight over the, you know, 100,000 metrics you're trying to get. Get 10, you know, that you can agree on. Um, and the last one, I think, if I could stomp my foot and stand on my head, get you to move in this direction. I heard it earlier about standardization. I heard it about, you know, common inputs. It's time, folks. When I look at my ballistic and blast problem, and I got now one model runs, and I got to take the output of that, and I got to, in some cases, it's in paper, and I got to walk it over here and plug and chug it into some other model. That is not state of the art, and I know you can do better. But it takes some hard discussion about what that architecture needs to look like and what those standards and interfaces should be. And how do you account for the fact that there may be a little slop in the system? Okay, one model may be giving you the R squared of you know, 0.99, but another model might only be down around 0.45 in a cognitive model. I'm okay with that. I just need to know it in my output. That's all. So how do you deal with that as these models get better and better? Don't just say, I'm going to continue to work on my one model, make it better, and then someday I'm going to throw it over and then we'll, we'll be able to integrate it. You want to be doing that now. You are, these models are, are very mature. If you keep going, you're going to be going like this. What you want to do is turn that trajectory so you come together and come up with some sort of, a, of an architecture that you can do some interfacing of these models. The last point I'd tell you, which I didn't put on here, but I thought about it while I was listening, <clears throat> was uh, the fact that there's a lot of data out there. and Validation is important. All right, So I need to know how good they are. They don't have to be perfect. I just need to know how good they are or they are not when I, when I use them for that whatever application. Um, and in validating the models, there's a lot of data out there that already exists. Many, many of you, plus your teams back where you come from, have collected human data. Take advantage of it. The, 
one thing that really, um, I'll just be frank, irritates the heck out of me when I talk to my modeling team. And the you know, second thing they say is, we need human data. We need data to do this and this and this. And I say, well, did you go down the hall and talk to the XYZ team that just finished the experiment collecting you know, alpha prime data on human that is exactly what you're looking for? You gotta figure out a way to make, have visibility of data that you can share and is shareable to do these kinds of validation efforts. There's lots of it out there. Uh, there will be gaps, but until you know what's there and you start using it, then you won't know where the gaps are. And I want to fund the gaps. I don't want to fund, you know, rehashing, collecting data that we already have. So for me, it's all about that bottom thing down there in the, in the uh, right survival of the soldier right now. Uh, I want them to go do what our nation is telling them to do in the worst environments possible, and I want to bring them back whole uh, and, uh, and uh, in one piece. And there's some acknowledgments, and with that, I think I have a couple minutes, well, maybe one minute before lunchtime. If there are any questions, I'll take it. Hey, who, um, who is that guy? I don't know. <laughs> Always in trouble. Uh, you talk about validation. Uh, could you maybe elaborate a little bit on the how much validation you'd like to see in the model? You know, one person, five people, 20 people, how long that takes? You know, how do we work that into our, our whole process? Yeah. How, how, how do we prioritize that? Because often it gets a little short shift. Yes. So anytime we start a modeling effort, and we being in the Department of Defense, and I would suggest that any of you take this stance, anytime you start a modeling effort, you need to have some validation component to that so you know how good your predictions are. Otherwise, you know, I can make as good a prediction, you know, just by flipping a coin. Now, the answer to your question, Brian, is it depends, okay? Now, that's not a weasel word answer, but it's depending on what I want to do with that, how tight a band I need around, confidence band around that prediction, okay? So, if I'm really looking at a hard design on where I put something in a vehicle, I probably need a pretty tight prediction around that that my confidence interval is very high, that I don't go bend metal and then go, oh, should I add a V8, I can't, you know, can't reach that. It's outside of my... Now, if I get and I'm going back to my soldier and I'm giving them better efficiency in increments face what the problem is that they have, I'm willing to take a lot bigger band of uncertainty around that because I know I'm moving in the right direction. And so I think you have to look at what it is you're trying to predict out of the model or the uses, and then you have to say, how confident do I need to be? And therefore, upfront plan your validation and fund it accordingly. And oh, by the way, I'll get you when you get back. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, so if there's an opportunity to share, is how much classified information? Input is only as good as, or the output is only as good as the input. So how much information are you willing to share for the community to support you? We're willing to share lots of it. The only time we get into we're not willing to share is when there are data that expose a potential vulnerability to our troops. And when we recognize that, and hopefully we do, uh, we will pull that behind the fence and mark it accordingly. Um, in individual cases, that's not too common right now. Okay. Sometimes what happens is by the third experiment, we start to get a picture, and the aggregate of the data then starts to suggest 
of vulnerability, and we might have to revisit a decision and pull it back. But for this community, I'm going to tell you, you know, 80%, 90% of what we do, we can share. And we're open to do that. And so what I would say to y'all is I got two of my PhD scientists here. You heard from one, Brian Corner, and Lee Hasselhoist, who was my uh, uh, model on the, on the one slide. Uh, see them during the course of the deliberations. Now here's Lee, he's got his I'll hand just, up. I'll uh, just add that tomorrow's military panel will be discussing some of these same items with a uh, great group on the panel. Uh, good time to ask questions and such also at that time. You know, I think, I think that by looking for those spots that we can share data, can leverage ideas, uh, you know, we can propel our own interests forward at a much faster uh, rate. So uh, I'm all about that. All right, I guess it's lunchtime. Thank you very much for your attention.